Oh, the two photos up there, the um, the fellow with the suntans, Lindsay Bookie, who I had a hell of a lot to do with in the um, Simpson Desert over the last 20 years. And uh, down below, the little white face there, you can just see him. That's me at about six years old with all the mates that I had at Yundamu. When I was a kid, that's where I grew up. My dad was a missionary, came up here in 1950, spent 25 years out there, and I grew up out there as a young fella and had a great time screaming around the bush. Learned to drive a motor car when I was eight years old, and I learned to drive a motor car when I was about 20 years old, real fast, going for a ride with Damien Ryan over there. Back from Fink once. No, I won't mention that, of course. But um, he had a little uh, Chevy Love Ute, and mate, what that thing could do was absolutely amazing. Anyway, we're, we've survived. But there's an awful lot of people out there who are pretty brainless about driving in the bush. And um, I started at a training organisation in. 19, when was it? Long time ago. In 1995, in Heli Crescent, and we've had over 4,000 people through our training organisation, and most of them can't drive, which is a real shame. Even after a couple of days in the bush, you feel like packing them in a bag and sending them home, which is true, right? Now, the idea, the idea way for looking after your fleet is policy, um, but that kind of gets ignored and the longer term people are in an organisation, the more they ignore policy. And, you know, you don't want to go down the punitive route of having HR punish people for driving badly. So a data log is a great way of tracking and saying, when you say to someone, hey, you've destroyed this car after 10,000 Ks, and they said, it was like that when I got it, say, well, hang on a minute. Here's the data that proves you didn't. Um, there is an AQ2 system which monitor, which actively logs the speed, so it constantly monitors what you do and where you go. There's an AQ3 with, uh, that reports back where you've been, and an AQ4 which has a panic button, so if you have an accident, it reports back um, with emails and SMSs. Um, I'm, I'm not a really big fan of these. They are handy for fleet managers to, to see what their cars are going through and maybe suggest policies on how the drivers could improve. Um, I know the unions absolutely hate them and personally I don't like the idea of being tracked. Um, but, you know, in the right environment they're a great tool. This one on the other hand here, this is what they call an active OBD. Um, this, can pl this plugs into the same slot. You only need one of these per fleet. They can do pretty much any car in the fleet. They just take it from car to car. This can reprogram the computer in the car. And when you're reprogramming that, you can put in a maximum speed limit. Uh, on pretty much all Toyota's Mitsubishi, anything not European. And it's pretty easy to use. The AQ1 started about $100 and go up to about $300 for an AQ4. These devices here are about $600, but they only need one in the in the shop. And every vehicle can be plugged in and done in about five or six minutes. So that's just one of the tools you can get. Not many people know about these or use or understand them. They're, you might see a mechanic using them if you come in with a check engine light off. They'll put that on to see what the car's upset about. Um, but when you're resetting engine check lights, you can also set maximum speed. And if you are going to get one of these, just remember there are two types, active and passive. Passive just read the data, active ones can change it. Um, the easiest way to spot the difference is the active ones will be several hundred dollars more expensive. Um, these are the most common tracking, uh, uh, tracking solutions for fleet management. Um, what I've seen around town, and it's highly not recommended is this one here, this third one, GPS tra uh, 3G tracking. It's a device you can get for about 25 bucks. It's about as big as a packet of matches and sits uh, on the bumper of a car. 
uses a 3G network and if the car speeds it reports it and if it goes outside of a certain boundary it, it'll call up and report itself missing. They're very, very cheap. They're from about 25 bucks, so that's why they're popular. They usually find wind up on plant equipment like tractors and things like that. And they cost about five bucks a month for the SIM card. Very cheap. Um, the other system we see a lot on the federal government cars is the Oricom inbuilt systems. They're about 500 bucks and about $22 a month to maintain. If anyone's driven a federal government car, they would have seen the red panic button on the dashboard. Um, these have a satellite relay back to their office. Um, they've come with a panic button. If there's an emergency, they'll take, you know, they'll report that you're in trouble. Um, they're not a bad system, but John and I personally prefer the spot tracker or the inReach. Now, the spot tracker is about $250. It's about the size of a packet of cigarettes, so it can sit nicely in your pocket. They're about $15 a month to run, and what they do is they put, they report back to a website, of all things, your location, every 10 or 15 minutes, whatever you set it to. Um, and if it's got a panic button on there, so there's an emergency and a non-emergency call button that sets out a pre, uh, like a pre-programmed text message. Um, what it does is it gives you a, it gives you a URL like this. So this is Joel's spot tracker. So there's Alice Springs there. There's where I turned it on on the Plenty Highway. And you can see each of these dots is a mark every 10 minutes, along with the latitude, longitude, the time, you, time and date you were there, the battery status of the device. Um, there we went up to Jervois for fuel. And that's a station track, so we can go a bit faster there, so they're a bit further apart. <coughs> And with that, then you can overlay that over Google Earth and you can see the Plenty River down there, a mark every 10 minutes. Um, you can run up to 50 of these on, uh, per organisation on the one website, so you can have a, have a broad-based map with you know, a heap of spot trackers going. Or you can hand out individual URLs, so if you're travelling bush, you can your boss can follow where you are, and so can your significant other at home. Um, bosses have a nasty habit of finishing at 4.21, so it's, if you're still driving, it's kind of handy for, to know someone's looking out for you. And the reason, the reason I like the spot trackers over the vehicle trackers, besides the cost, is generally if something happens to you and you're not next to your car, it's, um, it's always on you. It's literally about that big. So if you fall down a ditch or you get bitten by a snake, you don't have to drag your carcass back to the car to press the help button. Simple as that. Um, the other one that they're the inReach, that's a very similar product to the spot tracker. They're about $450. The advantage they have is they can link to your smartphone through Bluetooth and you can send custom text messages up to about 50 characters. Um, about $450, 20 bucks a month. Um, but still, it's a lot cheaper than dying in the bush. But you're cool. Um, what about yeah. what? What about? I've had a lot of experience with the spot trackers from people um, using them in the West Monster. And here and getting located and having them, you know, out in the middle of West, Western Australia, a lot of you have got a flat tire on our cattle property. And send me a message, please ring this number. And I ran that number and some people went out and got it about three hours. Like the one thing about spot tracker is don't be in a hurry. Alright? Oh, yeah. You're in a hurry, you're in trouble. But what about those guys we got off the sand in the motorbikes? Oh, the motorbikes. There's six guys going to fall apart. Whenever that is a couple of weeks' time. Mm -hmm. Years ago, on we cut here bikes and had them through the sand as well as, and um, one of them got bored. Uh, one of them fell off the top. Yeah, broke his leg, I think. Yeah, and, and then the car wouldn't work. Bike wouldn't work. Hit the tracker, cobbles from half range, went and picked him up, put him in the back, brought him all the way back to town. Two days later, we went out and retrieved 
is his wife in a cruiser yet and um, brought it back to town and he was in five days trying to get that thing going. It was pretty amazing. But they are very, 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 very useful and one hell of an insurance policy. The, the other thing is, when you press the um, SOS button on a spot tracker, you um, it comes with a it, it comes with a certain amount of insurance to cover the rescue helicopter too. Um, I think it's up to five million dollars insurance. It's quite a bit. Yeah, well, that fellow that got remember there was oh yeah the other two, two oh, yeah with the liter of water. Well, the liter yeah. of water was stuck here on the edge of the desert. That's all I had left. So they got an air report from him, from our eyes that had come down and went out and picked them up and brought them back to where the, the fuel, uh, where they could get fuel. And um, yeah, it did. Well, it must have cost a bomb, but spot, um, spot paid spot for it. Paid for it yeah. So it, it's worth it, it really is. Yeah. So, Joel does run a training organisation, so it'd be very nice to show you some training stuff. Um, so, I, this is some quick research I did a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is all compiled by the NRMA in New South Wales. So, 91% of people served, they did a driver survey, 91% of people surveyed said they're good drivers, which I thought was optimistic, and so did they, so they broke it down. 62% of people with a green P plate or less can't drive manual. 31% overall can't drive manual. Not so common in the territory, but it's still very common when you when you're hiring staff from interstate. Um, you know, three out of ten can't drive a manual. It's going to be a problem if you want to put them in a troop. Um, 88% of people who've obtained their license in an urban area haven't driven on an unsealed road. Um, everyone who's grown up here has, but not everyone's growing up here, so um, well, we take it as part of just part of our day. A lot of people, it's actually quite a stressful experience the first couple of times, and that's a considerable part of Joel and, I, Joel and my workload is uh, getting people to drive appropriately on a dirt road. Um, Twenty-one percent of people under thirty have never driven for more than two hours. That's that's a pretty scary kind of thought. It sort of makes sense if you're on the East Coast with plenty of flights up to the Gold Coast, well, no one really needs to drive to more than two hours. 41% um, never changed a tyre. And 74% have not done a full emergency stop, which is more disturbing when you find out that the average age of NRMA's customers is 59. So when you bring that down to anyone under 30, it's something like 95% of people have not done a full emergency stop. Especially on dirt, and especially in a heavy four-wheel drive, um, most people on the east coast have not driven a troopy or anything like it. They're, that's well out of their skill set, and that's why we spend a considerable amount of time training and trying to get them right. And that's not to say people are, can't be good drivers; it's just they're inexperienced. So sometimes it's aptitude, and sometimes it's just experience. But we we get there most of the time. In in 5,000 students, Joel's only ever failed two people, and they kind of had it coming, so. Yeah, because we couldn't get out of the car. Yeah, you know, well, it was that. <laughs> um, I, did, I did want to talk to you about some safety stuff. This this photo here is taken between Cat 15 and 16 and in, in the Simpson. This um, one is what it Yeah. You said that one. You took it. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, the reason I wanted to show you this photo is because there's six cars in this photo. Um, it's inevitable you're going to get stuck in the, I'll break down, or I'll get, you know, three flat tyres, or get stuck somewhere in the desert. Oh, you need to get one. Yeah. Or get nice and bold. And it, <coughs> it doesn't really matter, whatever holds you up. If you get stuck, the first thing you need to do is stay with your car. Now, for those playing along at home, there's the cars there. She isn't really clear there, but it's a really good photo if you look on the computer later. Um, it's the way the police search for a car is they generally drive down the road. They look on the road, they look 50 metres to the left and the right, because that's generally where cars wind up. So cars aren't all that hard to find. 
People, on the other hand, are near impossible because when people get stuck and they walk, they hide behind trees, under shade, in culverts, in caves, they go cross country. It's nearly impossible to find a person. It's really easy to find a car. And besides, if you've got a well-equipped car with food and water and shelter, well, that's where all your stuff is. So you stay with your food and your water and your shelter and you're found pretty reasonably quickly. Um, it only ever really gets messy when people decide to walk. So that's what you need to do if you do get stuck. First of all, wear a hat. There's a reason the Cobras are popular. It's because they work. Um, next one up is seek shade. It's really rare for a car to break down all at once anymore. Generally, they'll go into limp mode first. Um, even if you've got a flat tyre, there's no harm in driving at you know, walking pace to find a particularly nice tree to pull up under. Don't stop in the middle of the road. It's pretty poor form for someone to come flying around the corner and have to dodge you. Um, now, we just had a lecture about heat stress. Stay hydrated. Much easier to stay hydrated than it is to recover from de dehydration. Now, these two are a bit unusual, stay hungry and be clean. Staying hungry has got nothing to do with any weird bear girl survival techniques. It's got everything to do with your mental health. You, just, you don't starve yourself, you just need enough to keep the hunger pains at bay. Um, if you do get stuck, your mind is a surprisingly weak link. Um, if you can take care of that, the rest of it will follow. You can, you know, when, you know, when these guys say, oh, you can survive, you know, four days without water and two weeks without food, that's generally if you're in a good frame of mind. If you're in a stressed out, angry, frustrated, scared, nervous, um, horrible frame of mind, that time frame shrinks considerably. So if you stay a little hungry, just don't pick out on your food, just eat enough to keep yourself um, keep the hunger pains at bay. You'll help yourself focus a lot clearer and start seeing things clearly. Um, the next one, being clean, comes in, in that same category. 99% to do with your mental health. You don't have to have a full shower, but get some baby wipes, your face, your armpits, chest, groin, back your legs, anywhere that sweats. Give yourself a tub up and a clean up. 99% um, to do with your mental health, 1% to do with whoever picks you up will not appreciate you not smelling like a stray dog. <laughs> and be cool. Nothing to do with temperature and everything to do with your mental attitude. The, the four wheel drives you get sent bush in are really expensive. Most organisations aren't going to let one of those go missing too easily. You're going to get found sooner or later. That's what you do in that sooner or later that's going to cause you problems. Um, assuming you're uninjured and your mind being surprisingly weakly, go and read a book, watch a movie on your phone, um, take a nap. That's a great way to burn off four hours. Um, you know, if it's getting dark, go and build a fire. Occupy yourself somehow. If you just sit there stewing over your predicament, you're going to start thinking and getting bad ideas. And that rational voice in your head that's telling you to just chill out is going to get quieter and quieter. And the crazy one that tells you to walk is going to get louder and louder. Yeah, there's a, a, uh, a publication out you can get on that called the um, WA Police um, Fire and uh, four-wheel drive manual and if you can get that as a copy if you want a url give me a yell and i'll send you a copy because it really is good it's about i don't know 20 pages of what the western australian police put together about 20 years ago and quite worthwhile you can actually survive off it i've got a video to show you here this is this is actually filmed down on the uh, old south road For most people, there's a lot of dirt road driving before you get to do any off-road driving. As soon as you leave the bitumen, high range four-wheel drive. Um, it, it gets the power down easier to reduce the incidence of the corrugation. Um, it allows the vehicle to brake better. It's much easier on the drive line, it's much easier on the, on the vehicle, and it's much easier on the road. Keep your speed down, 80 k's an hour is probably too fast in a lot of conditions. But anybody that's trying to do 100 k's an hour on dirt road is probably not real sensible. Many vehicles these days are fitted with stability control. Leave it on. There's no need to turn that off if you're driving on dirt roads. Oncoming traffic. It's always courteous to actually slow down for oncoming traffic to reduce the chance of a rock um, being bounced off your rig or your camper trailer and smacking someone's windscreen. 
Ah, uh, yeah, seatbelts. Even if you're off-road, even if you're on dirt road, seatbelts allow you to stay in the vehicle if an airbag goes off. It allows the vehicle to protect you. Headlights on during the day, that's another good tip. This has got to be one of the roughest roads in Australia. We're doing about 30 kilometres an hour. Uh, this is the sort of road that destroys tyres. Ow! Destroys suspension. It's really not much fun. Oh, oh, oh. Um, we've seen quite a few different uh, different types of road terrain today. From soft sand about 15 kilometres ago, corrugations, um, hard packed clay, big rocks again, like what we saw yesterday. Um, it's hell on cars, but a, 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 one thing you can do to make life easier on your vehicle and yourself is run appropriate tyre pressures. I usually go to 25 psi. That uh, makes life a lot easier on the drivetrain and suspension. It gives you a little bit more grip. It also reduces the incidence of puncture. It means the tyre is not quite so hard and it's not going to get speared by a, a stick or a rock. Um, we've been punishing the poor little pile-ups this morning at 25 psi. I'm actually going to go down to 15. We've been battling corrugations for most of the morning. Um, it's been drumming the car almost to bits. We stopped a little while ago and dropped our tyre pressures down to 15 pounds and it's absolutely transformed the way the car rides. Some quick tips for driving on dirt roads. First of all, put your seatbelt on. Um, you're almost 20 times more likely to have an accident on a dirt road than you are on a bitumen road. Not not just because the um, dirt road's out to get you, because most of them are pretty badly made. Um, most of them aren't planned. They've just sort of appeared there over time and never, just never been sealed. Um, next thing you want to do is put your car into high range four wheel drive. Um, it's, it used to be the way in, a, in the older 80 series Land Cruisers and earlier, that you drive around in two wheel drive till you get bogged and then you put it into four wheel drive. Um, that, that was true 25 years ago, it's not anymore. Uh, these cars are meant to be driven around in high range four wheel drive when they're on the dirt. If you've got a Prado or a 200 series cruiser, you press the centre diff lock button. Um, next up, reduce your tyre pressures a little. Um, as a small, could run the entire course on this alone. Um, generally, I like to go down, uh, well, whatever the whatever's recommended in the door frame of the car. If the car recommends 30 PSI, um, I like to take about a third of that off straight away. If it's really rough, I'll take about half of that off as a general rule. Um, there's, a, there's a whole heap of science behind it that I won't go into, but it's, um, in fact, there's a whole lot of science behind it. And Joel's a, Joel's a bit of an expert at that, at getting tyre pressures right. Um, I took a Falcon Ute over the Simpson Desert five, five times, so I figured I learned what tyre pressures are about. Mm. Yeah. There's, uh, there's a lot of advantages to driving with flat tyres or lower tyre pressures. First of all, you put more rubber on the ground, so you're going to get more grip. So when you, go in, when you go to swerve around something, there's more rubber on the road, it's going to help you turn. It's also going to help you brake, but a lot better. You got more rubber on the road, more grip on the road. It's as simple as that. There's, there's the um, The ride will be a lot smoother because the tyres are going to be absorbing the little bumps and letting the suspension take care of the big bumps. Um, there is a maintenance issue, especially in your own car. In your fleet cars, well, that's someone else's problem, but in your own car, having lower tyre pressures, you're going to have a lot less maintenance issues with the car hammering itself to bits. Um, there's a thing that doesn't get spoken a, a lot about called ancillary handling. Um, if you think of a basketball, you pump it up, bounces really good, you let half the air out, you drop it just flat on the ground. It's the same with your tyres. If you let half the air out of them, they're not going to bounce and ricochet, which will keep them very consistent when you're driving. So as well as having improved grip, improved cornering, improved braking, as well as that, they be, when you let the tyres down, they become very predictable. Um, 
which, is, which makes your handling a lot safer as well, makes it a lot more comfortable to drive. Um, another thing that isn't commonly known is it drastically reduces driver fatigue. When, when, they release a new, when a manufacturer releases a new car, if you look deep in the specifications, you'll see a number called an NVH number. It's a number out of 100. It basically stands for noise, vibration and harshness. You lower the noise, the vibration and the harshness, you lower the driver fatigue. Now, a lot of people say that's, that can't possibly be true. Well, if you think about this, you jump on a flight from here to Sydney or Melbourne, it's two and a half hours, all you do is you sit there, you eat a sandwich, you watch a movie, but you get off the plane completely tired and wrecked. All you've been doing is sitting there. There's a lot of noise in aeroplanes you can't hear, it's at too high a frequency. People who put on noise cancelling headphones bounce off the plane like it's not a problem. It's because they've removed a lot of the noise, they've removed a lot of the fatigue in the same process. So driving with lower tyre pressures is fa absolutely fantastic. There's the reason we don't do it all the time is there's two real consequences. When you get back on the road, you'll get slightly worse fuel efficiency because the radius of the wheel shrunk a little bit. And there's a little bit of rolling resistance and other stuff going on, but it equates to about three to 5% more fuel when you get back on the bitumen. But the real consequence is heat. Hot tires blow. Um, in fact, we've all seen tires that look like that, shredded to bits. That's a heat blowout. A puncture of the tyre just goes down, but a heat blowout, the tyre basically shreds itself. Um, if you remember back to year four science, back to primary school, you'll remember there's kinetic energy and heat energy and chemical energy. All of the kinetic energy coming into the tyre's got to go somewhere, it gets dissipated as heat, and hot tyres basically self-destruct. Um, they start going a bit wobbly about 65, 70 degrees, um, the, way to, the way to test it for yourself is if you were to pour a cup of hot coffee and put your hand on the side of the cup, that cup is generally about 45 or 50 degrees. So what you'd do is you'd lower your tyre pressures down. And look, keep in mind I'm taking a six hour course and condensing it to about 30 minutes. Um, you lower your tyre pressures down, you drive on, on, the, on the corrugations for a couple of hours Get out, put your hand on the sidewall of the tyre because that'll be the hottest part. If you can't put your hand on the sidewall of the tyre, it's too damn hot and you've got to do something about it. Now you've got two, th two ways to lower your tyre, uh, the temperature in your tyres if they are getting hot. First of all, if you're back on the bitumen, you can pump them up. You put more air in them. It's as simple as that. If you've got a compressor or at the next roadhouse, um, it might be getting hot because you've overloaded it and the tyres are sitting out wider. Um, but if you do that on the dirt, you'll negate all the advantages you had by lowering them in the first place. The other option to reduce the heat in the tyres is to slow down. So you might be able to drop your tyres down to 15 psi, roll around all winter long without a problem at 100 k's an hour, all day and all night, and never have a problem. But we're coming into summer now, and suddenly, you know what, 130 on the dirt probably isn't appropriate anymore. Not because of your stopping distances or anything else, but because your tyres are going to overheat and they're going to blow. And when, when tyres blow from heat blowouts, they're usually loud and dramatic and involve screaming and crying and carrying on. It's great fun. Um, don't recommend it though. And the other thing, try not to drive at night if you can help it. Um, animals will see your headlights and run towards the light and it's a pretty poor form to run them over if you don't have to. And Try not to tailgate. It's not so much a... Territorians don't generally tailgate on dirt roads, but people with Victorian number plates do. It gets rather tedious after a bit. So I did want to show you a couple more videos, this one in particular. Nine years ago, this was the reality for Toyota Hilux when we tested it in the Moose test. Uh, almost flipping over and uh, now, Nine years has passed, nothing has evolved. This extremely dangerous behavior shows itself at 37 miles an hour. The 
competitors like uh, Volkswagen Amarok and Nissan Navara. They can do it in 42 miles an hour and not even showing anything close to that dangerous behavior. When we conducted the retest of the Hilux, we used uh, a car with 17-inch wheels and we could see that the lower grip level just made the behavior slightly better. But nevertheless, it's nine years later and this is still the basic behavior of the Toyota Hilux. Ain't good enough, not even close. I like this bit. See the driver's face? <laughs> Yeah, so the Hilux is actually one of the more stable utes available on the market. That's how they swerve at 70 k's an hour, so about 100, a oh, bit over 100. Um, that's while they're completely unloaded, you know, a driver and a passenger. Once you start putting gear in the back, that puts the centre of gravity further back. Um, trailers are an unknown quantity because sometimes they're loaded and sometimes they're not, and it gets crazy. And that was also on a nice sealed road where it's very constant and very predictable. When you're on dirt, you'll, you might slide, you might grip. The front wheels might slide and the back wheels might grip. Anything could happen. So as a general rule, I recommend not swerving if you can help it. Now, I wanted to... Yeah, well, that's what I wanted to show you. Um, I wanted to show you this as well. This is a stopping distance. This is actually measured from a troopy. And I'm only interested in the 100 kilometer an hour column here. If you're driving at 100 k's an hour, which is a pretty typical speed on a dirt road, you're covering about 27.8 meters per second. So if you think of a football field or a soccer field, you'll cover that every three seconds. Um, so we've got a few times written down there. So hazard time. If a big old bull camel steps out in front of you, it takes about a second and a half to compute that, hey, I should probably stop for that. Oh, wait a minute, it better be an emergency stop. Everyone's more or less about the same. Um, so if you're doing your 28 metres per second, one and a half seconds, you're going to go 40, 41 or 42 metres. Now, down here we've got the reaction time. That takes about the same to come off the accelerator and onto the brake. It's a surprisingly complex move. It involves bending your ankle, your knee, your hip, shifting your weight, reversing the process. And if you're in a manual, foot on the clutch and if you're skinny grabbing the steering wheel too. Um, or if you haven't got the seat adjusted properly. So we've given another one or two, one and a half seconds there. So you're up at 82, 83 metres before you've even touched the pedal. Now distraction time is my personal favourite and if you say you're not guilty of it, you're a liar. Because every single one of us has been playing with the CD player, a phone. If you're a parent, you know you've got to yell behind yell over your shoulder at your kids, because that's what good parents do. Um, the one that takes the most time is smoking, because people will concentrate more on their hands than on their feet, and they'll go, oh, shit, ash, break. Great fun to watch. Um, and they do it all the time. Next time you're sitting in traffic, watch it. The smokers will see a green light, and they'll go, oh, I've got to go. Take a drag, ash, and then they drive. And same with when they brake. So two seconds of distraction time, second and a half to see the hazard, and another second and a half to react. The actual stopping distance of a troopy on dirt is about 60 metres. So what that gives you from 100 k's an hour, a reasonable distance to expect you to stop is about 200 metres. Um, and knowing that they're not real great at swerving and knowing that it's going to take 200 metres to stop, what that says to me is, Everything from about here down, as far as I'm concerned, is dead. You can't swerve for it, you can't avoid it. Um, you can slow down for it, but you're gonna hit it. Which is a pretty terrible, morbid way to drive and everyone will be driving around at 40 k's an hour if that was the case, but the real world way to reduce your stopping distance, um, you know, Joel and I teach specialised braking techniques and other fun stuff. Um, we'll get that 60 metres down to mid 40s by the time we're done with you. But um, the real world way to, to 
shorten your stopping distance is to look further down the road. If you're looking right at the horizon, the further away you see something, the more time you've got to deal with it. And it doesn't even have to be anything important. You can see something unusual, a bit of rubbish on the road, a new hole that's opened up after rain, um, stock on the road. If you, you see a big old road train coming towards you, it's hoovering dust over your side of the road. If you see it early enough, you can pull up on the right hand side of the road. Don't do it right in front of the truckie, they get really upset about that. Um, but, you know, the further away you see a hazard, the more time you've got to deal with it. And even if it isn't a hazard, even if it's something that could potentially be a hazard, um, the, one, the one I see all the time, particularly um, around communities, is a car will pull up on the side of the road, mum and dad will go into the bush to uh, pick some tucker, they'll leave the kids in the car and the kids will come out and wave because that's what bush kids do. Um, they'll stand in front of you while you're doing a hundred and you shouldn't run over them, it's poor form. There's a lot of paperwork. But if you see, if you see a hazard though, or you see something that could potentially be a hazard, what you can do is take your foot off the gas just for a second, you'll bleed it down to 80. Now suddenly when you do that, you'll have 33 metre hazard time, 33 metre reaction time, 33 metre stop. You're down to about 100 metres. This is irrelevant because you'd be paying attention. That's just by looking further down the road and asking yourself what could possibly go wrong. Okay. Uh, this is the abbreviated of a version of a very long course, but I thought I'd share this with you anyway. And I do have a, a, one or two other things I want to show you. Okay. Yeah. yeah, this won't take too long. These two cars here, exactly the same car, exactly the same driver, same weather, same fuel, same tyres, no other variables, except the blue car's doing 70 k's an hour and the red one's doing 100. Red one's doing 100 because red cars are faster. Okay. So God's got a sense of humour. He drops a tree on the road. The blue car hits the brakes and skids to a stop, millimetres to spare, gets out, changes his undies, thinks, how lucky am I? Um, he's missed that tree. He's okay. So he's gone from 70 to zero in the perfect distance. Now, the red car hits the brakes at exactly the same time. It's inevitable he's gonna hit the tree. And excluding any other variables like extended reaction times or anything like that, my question is, how fast do you think he hits that tree? Um, the answer to that is actually, you'll hit the tree at about 72. The the reason being is that it's a myth that speeds bleed, bleeds off in a linear fashion. It actually bleeds off at the square root. So if you're doing 100 k's an hour and you hit the brakes and you skid to a stop, if you skid for five seconds, the first four seconds are gonna be going from 100 k's an hour to 80 k's an hour. That last one second is gonna be going from 80 to zero. Now, the reason I tell you about this is because out of the 30 odd people in this room, Someone here is thinking, I'm not gonna run over an animal. I'm gonna skid down to about 40 or 50 and then swerve around it. And I'm here to tell you that's not gonna happen because nobody is coordinated enough to skid for exactly 4.45 seconds till they're down to an appropriate speed to swerve. So if you're worried about hitting animals, get it out of your system before you start driving, okay? Here's the real fallacy of speeding. And this is, this is kind of important. When you speed, you achieve next to nothing. So if, if we were both sitting out on a, um, on a 50 kilometer leg and you left at 100 k's an hour and I left at 130, and I've chosen 130 for a very specific reason because as well as your, um, as well as your speed bleeding off in, at the square root, your risk actually increases at the square root. So 130 k's an hour is exactly double the risk of 100. Um, so if, you, if, we, if we're both leaving on a 50 kilometre leg, you do 100 k's an hour, you'll get there in 30 minutes. If I did the same 50 kilometre leg at 130, which is double the risk, I'll get there in 23 minutes. I'll have achieved seven minutes. I'll probably still be in the car park when you get there. In fact, no, most of the territory roads, I'll probably still be in sight for most of the trip. Um, 
so the achievement's next to nothing. Um, humans are unpredictable. Distraction is the biggest thing with humans. Hmm. Well, the thing is, when you fatigue, you, you lose your ability to judge risk. So I'd like to say I could drive to Adelaide at 130 all the way, but I can't really. Because every time I pull up behind a truck or behind a caravan, I'll be slowing down to 100. And then I'll be speeding up and I'll be overtaking all day. Overtaking and manoeuvres like that take extra risk. Now, if you're an hour into a 15 hour trip, you know, you're gonna be pretty relaxed about it. Okay, you're behind a truck, you're just gonna sit tight for five minutes till that car right on the horizon passes. And then you're gonna go for it. By the time you get to Port Adelaide and fatigue set in, it starts increasing your risk because once you start fatiguing, you start losing your ability to judge risk. You'll start seeing 50 metre gaps and just go for it. Um, any, anyone who's done a long road trip knows you're far, more, you're far more likely to overtake in the last 100 kilometres or so. You get a bit of get there itis and you push a bit harder than you necessarily would. And that's where accidents happen. So um, it's a long convoluted way of saying, slow the hell down. It's going to be much easier for you. Yeah. Um, where is it? No, I don't want to show you that one. I broke it. Yeah, that's that's all we we prepared for you today. But do you have any questions for Joel? Or um, there's there's not much he hasn't done on a ro on a car trip, so um, there's not much he can't answer. Yes, dear. Um, just. How often you would recommend a people upskill to do a full drive course? If but they haven't done it in tw in within 12 months, you know, when was the last time you changed the tyre? When was the last time you did an underwater check? When was the last time you pumped your tyres up to the right pressure? When did you put, you know, you figured tear pillars? When did you check your water containers last? All the tools and everything that are in the back. That's. You need to check that. If you haven't done that within 12 months, you need to redo it again. That's, that's the other thing, too. You know, like, there's a lot of people in here saying, Yeah, sure, I know how to change a tyre. Okay. Do you know how to change it without putting your back out or getting under the car? Because I actually saw a fleet manager um, in the last two weeks changing a tyre by putting it sitting on his bum, putting his leg either side under the car and lifting it up, um, which, which is great. But let's face it, you've got a flat tyre in the first place, so luck isn't necessarily on your side. Uh, so sticking your legs under a car probably isn't the best place. Um, Joel can teach you the right ways of doing it without putting your back out, without getting upset. And... Secret weapon is a shovel. Mm, makes it a lot easier. Um, yeah, it's, it's little things like that. And we, we have a lot of customers come in who, who've been given a bush job and they say, well, I've been in the bush for 35 years and um, I've driven everything with wheels on it. I know everything there is to learn. Um, we, we cheat a little bit because Joel knows more than everyone, so he can, everyone will learn something. You know? um, I, I like new drivers, that's my favourite, but um, Joel's got the skills and experience to teach even the most driver um, being the what are you an expert witness now aren't you for the for the Supreme Court that's, that's fun um, and there's not a lot between the two of us we can't come up with so every everyone will, will get something out of a four-wheel drive course and we generally tailor courses to whoever's on it at the time so if um, if you're a new driver I take it easy and if you've been around a bit and had a fair bit of experience, well, I can push it harder. Simple as that. I think there's a couple of people in here who have actually done Joel's course too. I've seen a few familiar faces. Anyway, anyone else? Cool. Wrap it up. Thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah thanks for having us.